Hi guys, welcome back. I am Red Zed, and today we're going to be taking a look at the brand new remastered Emergent Factions for RTR Imperium Serectum version 0.6.4. Yes, in the new update, guys, you're going to be able to play these Emergent Factions from the campaign selection screen, screen and it's going to simulate what will happen in game before you get to your nation. So today I'm going to go over all of these emergent factions and tell you what you could be looking forward to when the new update comes out. Something I am so excited for and has so much potential for the future guys. But without further ado, let's get into the video. So we're going to be starting with Taras guys, but I'm going to take you through the process of what it normally would be like. So we're going to start campaign as Taras here. Press start campaign and we shall go to the map. So here we are as Taras, guys. So it's going to run through a turn just so that it can simulate what the requirements were for spawning this nation out. And then you're going to be jumping straight into an emergent faction, which I think is just so cool indeed. What a great feature of the new update. Obviously before you could play these through the console but you couldn't play them through the main screen so that is the big difference. You can just press start a campaign from the main screen. It's going to simulate what the parameters are for them spawning and then you're going to spawn in as them. Obviously with that simulation though guys there is an element of RNG so your armies can be you know completely different depending on what you have spawned in uh, as well as maybe buildings and stuff like that. I'm not 100% certain on that one but your armies are going to be different every time so you might have a really cursed start or you might have a fantastic one depending on what the rng is saying to you today so let's now talk about taras or torrentum as it may otherwise be known it is a very very famous resistor to roman occupation founded in around 706 BC, when Taras is most famous for its struggle against the Romans with the help of Pyrrhus. This all came about because the Romans rode warships into the Tarentine Gulf, which you can see in front of us there, and this violated an old naval treaty saying that they should not do so. They also occupied three cities and garrisoned them around the region, including Regium, mainly against the Lucanians, not actually the Greeks of Tarentum, but the Tarentines got pretty upset with that and also pretty scared, which is very understandable. Now, due to their nerves about the Roman military expansion within the area, Tarentum decided to take a preemptive attack, which we all know is the best form of defense, guys, by attacking the Roman garrisons at Thurii and driving them into the sea. And now faced with possible Roman incursions into their own lands and Roman revenge, which we know is pretty brutal, let's be honest, um, they petitioned Pyrrhus of Epirus for help. Pyrrhus, of course, did go on to help, guys, and carved out a minor empire in Apulia and Magna Graecia, nearly getting all the way to Rome. But it was after Pyrrhus died in 272 BC that these guys were then retaken over by the Romans themselves, two years before the start of the mod, of course, and they would then go on to support Hannibal when he came all the way down to Apulia as well. So they do have a strong history of resistance against the Romans. So enough about the history, guys. Let's now talk about the gameplay of Taras over here. They will spawn with two cities, Tarentum and Metapontum, and they will spawn if a settlement in South Italy, that of course is not Taras themselves, themselves is owned by a faction with one of the following cultures, Carthaginian, Western and Eastern Hellenistic, and Greek, regardless of who owns Taras. So that is really cool. If there is, you know, Greek incursions into this land or even Carthaginian ones, the people of Tarentum will revolt very much like they did in real life. Two things to note with them gameplay wise, guys, is that Tarentum itself starts with a pretty low population. And as you can see, no walls whatsoever. This is to represent the massacring of this city in 272 BC by the Romans when they took it back. 
And along with that, the closest general to you, Mylon, over here. As you can see, he is an Epirote general. He is not a Roman general. And this is to represent Mylon, who was Pyrrhus's general, who was left in control of the city when Pyrrhus went to Sicily. So, really cool to see this historical figure in there as well. Of course, we don't get much information on Mylon himself, but it's pretty reasonable to assume that he would have defected to the Romans after Pyrrhus's death as well, which is why he gets kicked out of the city when you spawn. A really cool faction, and I think there may be a few challenge videos worth of videos with these guys. Imagine playing them and fighting the Romans. That will be really, really cool indeed. In terms of your roster as the Tarantines, you have actually a pretty decent roster. You get Deuteroy, which aren't the best Phalangites in the world, as you all know, but they are a Phalangite unit, which is still good. So they're going to be quite a good deterrent against the Romans, especially in defensive battles. Along with them, you get some Italiote Hoplites, which are a mid-tier Hoplite unit. And then standard units, so we get Uzonoi, Thuriophoroi, but Italiote Epibartai as well, which is pretty cool. A nice light infantry unit and all Epibartai are. And then finally, uh, uniquely some Tarantine Cavalry, which are a pretty decent versatile um, unit, like the Thuriophoroi Cavalry themselves. Pretty decent overall in terms of their versatility. Not amazing, not going to do fantastic in melee, but not going to do badly, certainly, as well. Uh, and then the rest of the roster, standard missile troops, your general, some Prodromoi, and some Zistaphoroi as well. Overall, I think Taras is a really interesting faction and going to be very cool to play when the update comes out. Next, we come on to Megalopolis, the great city that has a pretty rough and storied history as well. The city was founded in the 370s, maybe 360s BC as a political counterweight to Sparta by the Arcadian League. A interesting little tidbit, guys, is the fact that the locals believed that this is where the war versus the gods and titans began because there is uh, lignite deposits in the soil that would catch fire in summer and they believe that was the remnants of Zeus's lightning bolts. They also believed that elephants and rhinoceros bones that were found in the area were the bones of titans too, which is really, really cool, I think, anyway. But at the start of the mod in the 270s BC, Aristodemos the Good had managed to wrestle control of the city backed by Macedon. But it was later down the line that the city would really find its true purpose. Lydiades in 235 BC, who was another tyrant, gave up control of the city to make it a member of the Achaean League. Lydiades would use this to his advantage and become elected the Stratahos of the Achaean League several times over as well. However, as was customary in the Peloponnese guys, conflict with Sparta would arise and in 222 BC, the Spartans would lay siege to the city under Cleomenes III and destroy the city. However, many of the Megalopolitans managed to take refuge in Messene in the south and then rebuild the city later on. So a pretty cool city overall. In terms of how you spawn these guys, it's a 66% chance to spawn this faction if the Antigonid leader dies. So if you are the Antigonids guys, try not to get your leaders killed. That would be a good option. Or if the town itself revolts from any rule. So those are the parameters for them spawning out when you are not playing them, of course, guys. Now you only start with one city, Megalopolis, of course. One city with a relatively decent army with plenty of expansion options around you. Sparta, your mortal enemy, is probably going to be your best bet early in the game along with Messene as well. In terms of your roster, guys, you get a pretty standard Greek roster, but you do get Megalopolitan Chalcospides, which is pretty cool. Greek Hoplites, Thuriophoroi, Zistaphoroi as well, and standard sort of missile troops, apart from the Arcadian Peltas, which are one of your extra units that you get too. So a really cool little faction, and I think going to be uh, pretty difficult to start with if you want to start with them 
as usual for some of these emergent factions. Now let's move on to the famous city of Argos. But before we move on, guys, if you do enjoy these videos, you do find them entertaining and interesting, a like and a subscribe would be massively appreciated. It really does help the channel out. Argos, of course, is famous for one thing, and that is being the place where Pyrrhus was bonked over the head with a roof tile. But there is plenty more history behind this city-state too. And many people, including Herodotus at the time, believed that this was the place where the origins of the Macedonian Argead dynasty were to come from. Argos fought on many different sides throughout the 400s BC, fighting against Athens, fighting for Athens, fighting against Sparta as well, and against many other city-states. So they really did pick and choose which side to be on based on the situation at the time. But coming closer to our start date, guys, of 270 BC, they had actually managed to escape occupation by Macedon during the reigns of Philip II and Alexander, so they were not under Macedonian rule. Until, of course, poor old Pyrrhus would try to intervene in a civil dispute in the city in 270 BC, only to find that the armies of Macedon were already in the city. That was where Pyrrhus got that roof tile thrown at him and he was kill. Later down the line in 235 BC, the city was under the rule of a tyrant, Aristomachos. But, but Aratos, the Stratahos of the Achaean League, asked for the city's freedom because he didn't like tyrants very much. And Aristomachos actually accepted this and brought the city into the league. However, there was a large war going on with Cleomenes III at the time, and this led to Cleomenes taking the city of Argos as well. This would lead to Antigonus III Dozon coming to help the Achaean League, and therefore lead to a no longer independent Argos anymore. So how do these guys spawn in the game then? Well, there's a couple of different simulations and a couple of different ways. In terms of the ways for them to spawn, it is very similar to the Megalopolitan one as well. So 66% chance if the Antigonid leader dies, and of course, they will spawn if Argos revolts. But they do spawn with two cities, generally Argos and Presiae over here as well, but they will not get Presiae if the Spartans own it. So if the Spartans own Prisii, Argos will not get that city. So you may see this with just one or two cities, depending on how the simulation runs and what Sparta decides to do on the previous turn or two. In terms of their roster, guys, they have a pretty standard Greek roster, as you would expect, but they do get the Argive Epileptoi, which are a pretty darn nice unit overall very nice indeed in terms of your starting position you do border the spartans and the antigonids and potentially the achaeans as well depending whether they take sicyon in the simulation so yeah you have plenty of options for expansion but it's going to get again be a tough challenge to survive as these guys and do remember guys that when you are playing another faction you do get offered the chance to play as these emergent factions as well. So that is the other way in which you can get the emergent factions if you don't want to start out from the start or they spawn, you know, 100 years into your game or something like that. You can still play these guys or maybe even just press the tick, join, take a save, play as your nation for a bit longer, loading up the save, and then go back to these guys, these emergent factions, and see how you could have survived. Could you have beaten your empire that you built, which I think is really, really cool indeed. Well, now let's come slightly further north into Thessaly, guys, with the Thessalian League. These guys were a loose confederation of cities and tribes for quite a while, but we don't really get anything in the sources until about the 5th century BCE. But they do have one very notable ruler, Jason of Ferrai, and he worked to unite the agricultural population and the city population together, organizing the armies and military, and generally being a bit of a chad lord. However, this organization and decent rulership really did 
um, threaten nearby Macedon, which would lead to the assassination of Jason and the replacement of him by his nephew Alexander II, who was known to be a bit of a tyrant, shall we say. This completely rocked the area, leading to a series of brutal civil wars. In light of this, the Thessalians elected Philip II of Macedon to be the executive of the League in 352 BC, and in classic Philip II fashion, he tightened his restrictions on the areas, garrisoning them and causing them to come under all but in name, Macedonian rule. The Macedonians would go on to rule this area for the next 160 years, even though there were a few revolts during that time against Macedonian rule, but they would be finally liberated by Rome in 197 BC and become a really powerful faction in Roman Greece for many years to come after that. Now, the requirements for these are quite specific, guys, for the Thessalian League. So, we're going to go through them relatively slowly. So, if a city in Thessaly rebels and greater than three regions in Thessaly are owned by slaves prior to the revolt, they will spawn. However, there are also a couple of other um, ways that they can spawn. So, there's a 5% chance per turn for this uh, region to spawn if the Antigonid leader dies and the Antigonids own greater than three regions in Thessaly, which let's be honest, most of the game they are unless you are playing in Greece, or there is a 25% chance per turn if the Antigonid leader dies and the Ant Antigonids own more than three regions in Thessaly and the turn is greater than turn 75. So the later down the line, the more chance that these boys are going to come out. And they do, of course, spawn with their four settlements, which is really cool. I do really like that indeed. And of course, they have a relatively decent roster, predominantly focused on the Thessalian cavalry of course, the guys, which are insanely good cavalry. They are very, very good. If you want to get a full stack of them, it'll probably run through everything. They do get the Per Haiban cavalry as well, which is a light uh, lancer cavalry, which is actually better than the stats might suggest because that 30 charge is going to do well for you as well. Not a huge amount of infantry, but you can get plenty of AOR from the regions around you. Where you do spawn though, you do spawn slap bang generally in the middle of the Antigonids. So this will be a really interesting one. In fact, I think this one will be absolutely fantastic to do from playing as the Antigonids and seeing whether you can take on the Antigonid Empire that you've built later down the line. I think that would be absolutely fantastic. What a glorious faction once again. So let's now move on to Militos, guys, a city famous for having well-planned out streets and cities, almost like an American city is today, straight roads with right angles to each other. Before Persian rule in the 6th century BC, they were considered one of the wealthiest and greatest Greek city-states in the whole of the Aegean. Closer to the start of the mod, guys, Miletus was besieged by Alexander the Great of Macedon, who would then go on, of course, to conquer all of Asia Minor and into Persia as well. However, when Alexander died in 323 BC, Miletus came under the control of Ptolemy, who was the governor of carrier and then later under the control of Antigonus the first monothalmus but when Antigonus the first died at the battle of Ipsus they'd regain their independence again and have friendly relations with many of the successors of Alexander the city would then flip between the rival powers of the Seleucid Empire and the Ptolemaic Kingdom until eventually in 279 BC, Ptolemy II would wrest control of the city from the Seleucids and it would remain under their rule for a very long time. Before finally in 133 BC, after allying with Rome, they would become part 
of the province of Asia. So here you are, guys. You are on the coast of the Aegean over in Turkey, as you can see. I guess we should call it by the ancient name. We'll call it Asia instead, Asia Minor, um, over here in between the Seleucids and the Ptolemies too. So pretty tough start again, like we said, with many of these guys, but maybe one of the tougher ones just across the bay from your sworn enemy, Priene. Like these two cities hated each other. Militos was very much ordered and about, <laughs> I think, autocracy and stuff like that. Whereas Priene was more a hippie commune, shall we say. So these two cities really had different ideas uh, about ruling and really different ideas uh, about <laughs> about life in general. And therefore, they hated each other quite a lot. So I would suggest that is probably your best bet to go after Priene right at the start of the game, um, if you can. Now, how do you spawn the Milesians out of here? How do the Miletesians, the Miletosians, the, I think it's the Milesians. Um, you spawn them if Miletos revolts, they will just spawn 100% of the time. So whoever they revolt from, they will spawn. But there is also a 75% chance per turn if the happiness of Miletos is under 75%. So if you are the Ptolemies, Make sure that you are not, of course, getting the happiness under 75% for these boys. In terms of your roster, you do get your own Milesian Hoplites, which are a pretty decent Hoplite unit, as you can see. But the rest of the roster is pretty standard, apart from the Milesian Horifalarches, which are just a sli slightly better sort of Javelin unit. Uh, not quite a Peltast unit, but a... Nearly there. Nearly as good as a Greek Peltast unit anyway. So a decent one. But again, lots of AOR around this area. So you shouldn't have a problem getting some nice AOR troops. So now we move on to the Lysiad Kingdom. Now this is more of a sort of obscure faction, shall we say. Something that is really hard to find anything on at all to be honest. Um, and it's there kind of as a really fun alternate history type of faction. It is based on the Lysiad dynasty, a dynasty that ruled over this area of Sinada. It potentially traces its roots back to Lysias, who was a commander under Seleucus I Nicator. The village of Dokimaeon would later become known for Sinardic or Dosimite marble that became very famous and popular in Rome. Philomelos was likely the first ruler of this region, who is potentially the son of the first Lysias. His son, Philomelos's son, that is, had another son called Lysias, who then later went on to practice great autonomy in this region as the Anatolian parts of the Seleucid Empire gradually began to split from the greater empire. However, even though they practiced a lot of independence due to their uh, distance away from the Seleucid capital, they were very loyal to the Seleucid dynasty, and they would even fight in the early 100s BC against the Romans for Antiochus III. But after the Treaty of Apamea in 188, BC, the dynasty is no longer mentioned anywhere. So take that what you will. Maybe the Romans killed them. Maybe they simply just fell into disrepute and disrepair. Nobody really knows at this point, but a really cool faction nonetheless. So you get Sinada and Dokimaeon. You are actually a uh, Phrygian, I believe, in terms of your culture. So slightly different from the culture that the cities start with, which is Macedonian. But in terms of how you spawn, you will spawn if there are any Lysiad characters living in the Seleucid lands. So they will allow this faction to spawn. However, there are also some other requirements too that will allow them to spawn. There's a 2% chance per turn to revolt if there are no Seleucid rebel factions that are alive. There's a 5% chance uh, if there are living Seleucid rebel factions. And there's a 100% 
percent chance if either Sinada or Dokimayon revolt. So if either of these cities revolt, you're going to see this faction. Now the Seleucid Rebels, I believe they might be in next patch. So for now, that is a requirement that you might not see. Uh, but I could be wrong on that, so don't quote me on that. So mainly you're just looking to not allow these guys to revolt. Uh, and also not allow any of the uh, Lysiad characters to appear in the Seleucid Empire if you are them. Um, as well. In terms of where you start, you start right out here in Sonata in the middle. Um, so yeah, it's going to be an interesting campaign for you surrounded by Seleucids most likely and the Galatians up to the northeast too. So whether you can fight the Seleucids off, especially with their large armies nearby, I don't know. It's up to you to go and fight them off. Now, in terms of your roster, you do actually get a pretty interesting roster, which is a mix of sort of Phrygian and Seleucid units. So you get the Phrygian Spearmen here, which I don't recommend after playing Paphlagonia, guys, I've got to say. But you also get the Halkaspides over this way, a decent mid-tier Phalanx unit, as well as the Hypastis, which are a fantastic, fantastic Spear unit as well. In terms of your cavalry, you get a few Phrygian cavalries, as well as the Zistaphoroi, and the, um, what do you call them? The Scythed Chariots, guys, which is pretty insane. So that is really fun unit for you to get as well. And then along with that, you do get the Phrygian Javelinmen too. Overall, I'd ignore the Phrygians and just go for the Greek-style units. But, you know, they worked well as Paphlagonia for a little bit, didn't they, guys? But, um... <laughs> But yeah, they're, they're very difficult units to use, I've got to be honest. But a really cool faction as well. So now we move on to the Lycian League, which has a very long and storied history. This area was first acquired by the Achaemenid Persians from the independent cities in around 540 BC. In fact, it was Cyrus's the great policy of expansion into Asia Minor that led to their acquisition. The Lycians were initially hugely resistant to Persian rule. In fact, in the battle against the Persians, the, the Xanthians sallied out into the Xanthos Valley to fight the Persians. Realizing that they were hugely outnumbered and were going to be destroyed, they gathered up all their possessions, including their slaves, took them to one of the central buildings and burnt that building to the ground. They then fought to the death, which is thought by some people to be inspiration to the Spartans of Thermopylae some years later. However, they were generally left to themselves under Persian rule. There was not even a satrap that was installed in the area, so they remained pretty much independent in terms of their rule, just sending taxes back to the Achaemenids to keep the peace. They generally kept peace with the Persians. However, they did eventually join the Delian League during the Peloponnesian Wars of 431 to 404 BC. But when they dropped out due to, you know, defeats on the side of Athens, the Athenians sent a force to try and force them to rejoin the League. Not exactly the best idea, if you ask me. And this force did fail when they were beaten by Lycia's leader, Gurgis of Xanthos. After Alexander, they would then pass through many different ruling parties, including Antigonus himself, then Lysimachus, and then eventually the Ptolemies. They remained under the Ptolemies for nearly a hundred years before eventually the Seleucids maybe had control of the region around 190 BC, but the Peace of Apamea in 188 BC after the Seleucids' defeat at the Battle of Magnesia resulted in Lycia actually being awarded to the Rhodians. The Rhodian rule would remain in place for 20 years, and during that time, the Rhodians treat them pretty harshly. They petitioned to Rome for support because their rule was not just oppression of the people that they were suffering, but absolute slavery, or so they said. The Romans then freed them from the Rhodians in around 168 BC, but the Lycian League seems to have been formed somewhere 
around the 180s BC, and they would vote in their leader, the Lycaearch, from the member cities, each city having one to three votes, depending on how large they were. They were generally admired for their rule of the region, their just rule of the region, and Strabo spoke highly of their governance. They ruled over the area for over 200 years before they were annexed by Emperor Claudius in 43 AD. As you can see guys, the Lycian League is quite a little power player in the south of Anatolia, close to Rhodes if you want to go and take Rhodes, and surrounded by pretty much the Ptolemies and maybe a few other Anatolian nations like Selge and the generic Anatolians. Of course, the Antigonids have a Kaunos nearby too, and the Seleucids off to the north. But with all your port cities on the coast, I think you're going to be okay. This is a less difficult start compared to some of them that we have seen so far. These guys do have some quite specific parameters for them to form. So listen carefully, guys. So if a city in Lycia revolts, one of these cities that you are seeing now, while Rhodes owns most of Lycia, greater than four regions for greater than 10 turns, then they will form. Or if a city in Lycia revolts, while neither Rhodes, the Seleucids, or the Ptolemies own most of Lycia and its turn uh, 70 or greater, or if a city in Lycia revolts, no matter who owns it, and its turn greater than 100 and 50. Of course, remember all of these sort of um, these uh, trigger events are trigger events that are going to happen when you're not playing them, guys, from the main menu. So you can just click them on the main menu and jump in as them straight away as well. So completely up to you. But they are, I'm telling you them just so you know, for when you're playing the Ptolemies, if, uh, if this happens or you're playing Rhodes, you know this might happen to you as well. In terms of your roster, you get a pretty interesting roster as well as with most of these Anatolian factions. The Lycian Drepeno Foroi over here. A cool little sort of mini sickle wielding unit. Uh, not the greatest unit, but cool looking nonetheless. Of course, you get some Hoplites and some Thurio Foroi, as well as some Lycian Marines, which are also pretty cool. I do love the look of these boys. Some good morale um, and going to be a decent infantry unit. Although they have no shield, they're still going to do okay in melee because they've got a decent defense skill and a decent amount of armor too. Cavalry wise, standard cavalry, standard missile units apart from the Lycian archers, which are an okay archer unit as well. But again, lots of different um, AOR units around this region, including the Carrion's over here, Selge over this way, and of course, Ptolemaic AOR units from these settlements out here as well. So, um, a decent faction, and I think going to be a lot easier to survive than some of the other emergent factions that we've seen. So now let's move on to the Chrysaurian League, guys, down here on the southwest tip of Anatolia. This is another one that is very hard to find information on, so there's not a huge amount about them in the sources. They were a loose confederation of cities that were headed up at Stratonicaea, and each member had votes based on the amount of towns that they actually owned. They would assemble at the temple of Zeus Chrysauris of the Golden Sword, who, which was their um, pride and joy, shall we say. However, there was much religious competition. Miletus themselves had three cults dedicated to Zeus. This rivalry would lead to later conflict, and then Hellenistic kings would get involved in the resolution. The Ptolemies supported the Carians, but the Seleucids supported the Milesians, and after Antigonid mediation, the area would come under Seleucid control. And it would stay this way until again the Treaty of Apamea in 188. BC. However, as seen with the Lycians guys, these guys were not too happy with the rule that was imposed on them by the Romans, which was by Rhodes. It was granted to Rhodes, and they would later fight a rebellion for their independence when they were finally acknowledged 
by the Romans. So these guys start with three settlements, Kaunos, Stratonikea, and Alabanda over here. So a little bit spread out, although they are all in line, you know, Kaunos, you'll have to go through Ptolemaic territory to get between your settlements here um, as well, which uh, it's going to be quite difficult, I think, without annoying the Ptolemies um, too much. But how do these guys spawn? These guys, again, have quite complicated requirements. So if a city in Chrysauria revolts while Rhodes owns more than two cities in the region for more than 10 turns, then Chrysauria will form. Or if a city in Chrysauria revolts while a faction that is neither Rhodes, Seleucids, or the Ptolemies own most of the area, and it's a greater turn than, than 70. Or if anyone owns the region, but it revolts, but, an air but a city revolts, and it's after turn 150. Again, this is going to be an interesting start, I think, because you've got the Ptolemies and the Seleucids nearby, but there are a few smaller factions that you can pick off. Potentially Rhodes going on to Crete, Potentially the Milesians if they have popped out. Priene as well. Maybe Pergamon. But again, you're going to be fighting some large empires. And you're going to have to rely maybe on the Lycians to pop out of the Ptolemies to really feel secure in the area. These guys are Carrion too, which is really cool to see. And with that, they get a Carrion roster. So they get the Carrion Light Infantry, which is an armor-piercing unit, which is really cool. One of the few armor-piercing units in this region, some standard Thurio Fori and some Carrion Heavy Infantry, which are also a relatively decent unit because remember guys, although the defense of 35 is not so high, the melee attack of 12 with whatever weapon that is, I don't exactly know, is actually really good. Like, because most other factions infantry you're going to be facing are going to have low melee attack and they're going to have spears. And this weapon's going to do a lot more damage than spears, even if they maybe both have 12 melee attack. The rest of the roster is standard Greeks, but again, you're going to have plenty of AOR units in this region to choose from. And finally, in today's video, guys, we have the Silesians, who are most famous for their piracy, even managing to capture Julius Caesar himself, who later had the pirates who captured him crucified. <laughs> it was long a satrapy under the Achaemenid Empire until Alexander forded the Halys River in 333 BC and attacked the Silesian gates at night and conquered the region. However, after his death, it was a battleground for many of the vying successor states and fell under the dominion of the Ptolemies for quite some time, but was later ac acquired by the Seleucids, who, although controlling a lot of the region, didn't really control it with much strength apart from just the eastern lowland regions. Due to the hills and mountains along the coast, it was very easy for pirate gangs to establish themselves and never really be found or rooted out. Everyone was welcome to join the gangs, not just locals from the area. The area was known as Kilikea Traxia and would lead to numerous very powerful pirate gangs popping up in the region who would engage in raiding undefended settlements all across the Mediterranean and would engage in a large amount of slave trade with the Romans. And even though they came under the control of the Romans in 102 BC, the pirate gangs remained very powerful and continued to stir trouble in the region. It wasn't until Pompeii in 67 BC decided to intervene that the pirate gangs would see a little bit of a downfall. Pompeii made an ally of Tarkon Demotos, who was the king over the Silesians, and this would quiet them down for a little while. However, after this point, the land would pass between many different peoples within the Roman Empire, mainly as a reward to them. A bit of a poison chalice, if you ask me, but the Silesians continued to be rebellious and had two major rebellions against Roman rule. Then they were finally integrated by Vespasian in 109 
AD. So a very troublesome region for anyone to administer and the pirate gangs really did cause the rest of the Mediterranean a lot of trouble but were incredibly difficult to root out. So you can see over here, we are in the west of Silesia. Silesia also includes this part down on the plains, but this is the area that was really easy to govern, guys, because it is not mountainous uh, as this region is. So as you can see, a very difficult region to really control if you were a large empire at the time. But we start with three settlements, Korakizion, um, Isaura, and Loranda over here up in the mountains. So how do these guys spawn then? Well, if one of these three cities in front of you, Korakizion, Lauranda of Oaisalra, revolts, and one of the other cities of the Silesians, so some of these other Silesian cities down here, as you can see in this very rebellious region, if any of those revolt as well, or is it either owned by slaves or Anatolians, so if they do revolt and turn into slaves, or they're owned by the Anatolians, then these guys will pop out. So as you can see, the Anatolians do actually own Amemurion over here, and also Olbe. So Amemurion, if they keep hold of that, and you allow one of these cities to revolt as the Ptolemies or Seleucids, then it's likely this league is going to pop out. Not a league, sorry, it's likely that Silesians are going to to pop out so make sure you don't let any of these cities pop out uh, from your empire if you are any of the empires that hold them in terms of your start although you are quite isolated that isolation in my opinion gives you great opportunity because these regions are not easy to get to and there are not a huge amount of troops in these regions too so if you want to you could chain through the ptolemies here rather easily i believe without really following uh, having much resistance. You could also take out Selge, the Anatolians. You could even go into the central areas of the Seleucids and take a lot of these central cities in Pisidia over there, or potentially against the Cappadocians, but I wouldn't recommend that. I'd recommend going for the coast down here and getting rid of these guys, which will be really, really good for you. You do have your own culture, which is Silesian, which is really cool to see. And in terms of your roster, you do have the old Silesian Pirates guys. Very nice to see these guys. They're not a great unit, but really cool. You can go raiding around the Mediterranean with those boys if you want. There's also the Silesian Spearmen. Again, not a great unit. And on top of that, you do, though, get one really good unit, which is the Asian Royal Bodyguards, your generals bodyguard but along with that you get the asian units now remember guys these guys are not fully remastered because the asian units um the asian factions like cappadocia pontus etc haven't been fully remastered yet uh, they will be done along with the eastern factions um so these guys aren't fully finished uh, but when they are finished you will get a much fuller and uh, of course bigger roster to go with your really cool starting position and history well, I think that brings us to the end of the video, guys. I'm sure you're noticing that we've missed one out, and that is the Egyptians. But that is such a large revolt that I am going to cover that in its own video tomorrow with a nice little bit of history about them as well. So stay tuned for that. Make sure you do like and subscribe. If you did enjoy this video and you found it interesting and informative, it would really help the channel out and share it with anyone else interested in ancient history. One final shout out must go out to David D, who is my first channel member on the channel, guys. So if you do want to join the channel and get a membership, there is now a $1, one pound, one euro option for you. If you do really want to support the channel, obviously any support on the channel is hugely appreciated, guys. So if you do want to do that and get a shout out in one of these videos, you can find the link down in the description below. But without further ado, guys, thank you very much for watching. It's been a pleasure as always, and I will see you all again on the next video.